The Ryans had a small house on the avenue. The old man was a building contractor in a tiny way of business in Cork. His wife had died ten years before and left him with three daughters, Mal, Fanny and Bridget. Three goddesses. Old Ryan never knew how lucky he was and continued to lament the son he had three times aimed at. But there was hardly a romantic adolescent boy in the neighbourhood who didn't raise his cap to old Ryan as to the priest, partly in reverence, partly in hopes of impressing his spotty visage on the old man's memory, so that one day Ryan would say, who is that charming chap from St. Joseph's Terrace, and insist on having him to tea. The adolescent boy's mothers were far from sharing that view. If they didn't actually imply that the girls were fast, they made no bones about saying that they were flighty and that old Ryan had only himself to blame for not having married again some respectable, horny-handed widow who would have beaten manners into them. There were too many young fellas around the house altogether for their taste and really, the cut of it was a disgrace. The adolescent boys were horrified and their mothers disillusioned when young Jim Piper got into the clutches of Fanny, the second goddess, or she got into his, according to the way you view it. Neither view would be strictly accurate, for though Fanny shared the family irresponsibility, she had virtues that neither party would have respected. And though Jim might be no Adonis, he was a lad in a thousand. Father Murphy, our parish priest, was a decent poor man, but he had one great weakness. Whatever pretty girls he had banished from his conscious mind had come back to him in his dreams, all disguised as pound notes. And the plainer, coarser types took the form of ten shilling notes. His little weakness was known and laughed at. Once, when Jim was out of his time, Father Murphy thought it would be much better to come to him for his Easter Jews rather than to his mother, who would fight a coal man for sixpence. Jim took out his wallet and produced a ten-shilling note, which, as I say, was associated in Father Murphy's mind with the plainer type of female and caused fastidious shudders to go through him. Mr Piper, he said in a manly tone, I think you could afford a pound. I'm afraid I couldn't, Father, said Jim steadily. Well, I'm sorry, said Father Murphy, leaving him to God and his conscience, but I'm afraid I could not accept that from a tradesman earning good money as you are, Mr Piper. Very well, Father, said Jim, going a bit red, but still behaving with perfect respect. I won't press it on you. So Father Murphy went away and brooded on that plain-looking ten-shilling note till it was invested with all the mysterious grace and charm that Ryan's daughters had for an adolescent boy. After a week, he couldn't stand it any more and came back. I called for the Jews, Mr Piper, he said with a lofty air. I suppose I shall only have to accept your offer, such as it is. At Christmas you will, Father, said Jim stubbornly. The Easter Jews were offered and refused. Father Murphy flushed and almost struck him. I beg your pardon, he said. I was under the impression that I was addressing a Christian. It was more than an old man should be asked to bear. He had been too hasty, too hasty. He went off to brood on it, and the more he brooded, the wilder his schemes became. He thought of having a special collection for the presbytery roof, but he knew the bishop would scarcely countenance it. Bishops weren't what they used to be in his young days. Finally, he lighted on the plan of a charity concert and asked Jim to sing. Now, Jim wasn't much of a singer. Only one in the throes of passion would have thought him a singer at all, and better than Jim would have regarded the request as an honour. But not Jim. Right or wrong, he felt that it was only a roundabout way of getting the dues out of him, and he refused to sing without a fee. The idea of the fee nearly gave Father Murphy a stroke. It was the nearest thing to actual free thinking he had come across and he felt he understood at last the sort of man Voltaire must have been. A fee. Still, it took character to do what Jim had done and Fanny couldn't help respecting character. 
neither could old Ryan. As a tradesman, he was alarmed at the goings-on of his daughters with all sorts of counter-jumpers and sports coats and flannel bags, and it was a real ease to his mind to have one man around the place with whom he could discuss the bonding of brick and the seasoning of timber. Every week of Jim's life, he brought ten shillings of his wages for Fanny to lodge in her post office account, another old trades custom that Ryan approved of. The other young fellows who came to the house would have been more likely to touch the girls for ten bob. When Jim and Fanny had two hundred, they were going to start building a house of their own, a real masterpiece, according to old Ryan, who would build it for them. You don't know what you're letting yourself in for, Fanny said to Jim. You may be engaged to me, but you're going to marry my dad. I might do worse, replied Jim in his stolid way. Wait till he comes to live with us, said Fanny. He's too interested in that house to be healthy. Then, one Christmas, Fanny went out to do the shopping with the week's household allowance in her purse, ran into some of the lads in town and started drinking gin. She kept on saying she had all the money in the house and she really must go off and do the shopping, but all the Ryans had a great capacity for discussing what they ought to do without doing it. Coming on to six, Maul, in despair, had to go out and buy what she could locally on tick. When Fanny came back without the shopping done, Maul screamed at her. Fanny gave her lip and then Maul smacked her face. Fanny was a brooding, emotional sort of girl and she went up to her room and wept floods. Jim came up later that evening, a little bit lit up, but the sort of fellow Jim was, the more he had taken, the more his sense of justice was roused. And when Fanny tried to make him take sides against Maul, he refused. God damn it, girl, he drawled. Be reasonable. Maul has all the responsibility of the house on her, and you sitting down there drinking with Mick Leary and Ted Kavanagh didn't give a curse about her. Sure, of course the girl was mad. Now, character is all very well in its own place, but Jim didn't always know when it was out of place. As you're so fond of her, you'd better stick to her, snapped Fanny, getting up to go. Oh, said Jim, refusing to be put down by mere temperament. He'd be a lucky man that'd get her. You're not interested in me at all, Jim Piper, said Fanny bitterly. You're interested in my family and you're welcome to them. There was more truth in that than Jim would have been willing to admit, for his own home wasn't all it might have been. Fanny brooded over the quarrel, and the day after the holidays, in the mood of disillusionment that always follows on the Christmas holidays, feeling that there was no one in the world who loved her, she went to the post office, drew out all Jim's savings, £90, and took the night boat to London. Talk about scandal. The general view of the mothers was that Jim had got out of a cheap at £90. The adolescent boys felt that there was probably another side to the story. The Ryans talked and talked but did nothing, though everyone knew that Fanny had gone to stay with a family called Ronan who had lived up the road when she was a kid. When her name was mentioned, old Ryan would close his eyes and spread his hands in the attitude of a Christian martyr. His only consolation was Jim Piper, who behaved like a son to him. One evening, shortly after Fanny's flight, Jim took him out for a drink and the old man's mind turned to the thought of what had happened to him. He spread his hands like claws and closed them around the place he imagined Fanny's neck to be. <laughs> Have another drink, said Jim with an uneasy laugh. Oh, you'll be paid back, old Ryan said excitedly, slapping his knee. I'll see you're paid back. Ah, you'll do nothing of the sort, growled Jim. You had no responsibility at all for it. Ryan scowled and drew a deep breath at the very idea that he could possibly consider it anything but a debt of honour. After a few weeks, it boiled down to credit that Jim would receive on the house he'd built when he found another girl in place of Fanny. But Jim felt he'd had enough of girls. For months after, he was drinking more than he should have been. Then to everyone's astonishment, Fanny came home in a brand new tailor-made with a hat like a hoop on her. Apparently, the 90 quid was spent. The mothers, quivering with indignation, said the girl had no shame 
And even the boys felt uneasily that though a goddess might walk out into the night with someone else's savings, it was something approaching anticlimax for her to return without it. Her father threatened to kill her with his own two hands. But this was largely propaganda for Maul's benefit because the truth is he was a little bit tired of Maul's high moral tone, which was rather too like that of her mother, without any of the conjugal qualifications. Bridget was glad to see her too because she was doing a strong line with a bank clerk and Maul chaperoned them ferociously. The reason was that Maul had contracted a regular a sedate fellow called Considine who worked the drapery and drapers being the devil and all for respectability, Maul was taking no chances. For a month, she wouldn't leave Bridget alone with Fanny for fear Fanny might corrupt her. And whatever confidences Bridget got from her sister, she had to get in other people's houses. Bridget felt this was uncalled for, considering some of Maul's goings-on with her previous bloke, which she thought nobody knew about except the bloke himself. Then one spring evening at the cross, just as Fanny was getting onto the tram, who should get off it but Jim Piper? He raised his hat and Fanny, taken aback, stood and stared at him defiantly, waiting for him to begin hostilities. Hello, Fan, he said awkwardly. Hello, replied Fanny in a choking voice. Home for a holiday, he asked. No, for good, she replied. Go on, said Jim, trying to make conversation. Homesick. For God's sake, she whispered in an exasperated tone. Come on away, somewhere we won't be watched. They went off together up Montanotti, the suburban road they'd often taken on their courting nights. They went up Lover's Lane, a long, dark, winding lane with high walls and convenient gateways. It was coming on night, and behind the young leaves, the lamp at the lane's end had been lighted. Then Fanny began to storm hysterically. She said it was all Jim's fault for not standing up for her, that he knew she was heart-scalded at home and sided with her family against her. From the way she went on, it seemed that Jim was the one who'd gone off with the savings. He listened with a foolish smile until she'd talked herself out. Well, anyway, he said, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I did not enjoy myself, she replied quietly and bitterly. I only meant to take my fare and send you back the whole thing when I got a job, but they kept cadging and cadging till it all went on me. I all but threw myself into the river. Well, he said, what's done is done, and we can be thankful it wasn't worse. After that, they continued to walk out together. Only as things turned out later, they didn't confine themselves to walking. For one evening, Fanny broke the news to him that she was going to have a baby. She sounded awfully tough about it. They were lying in a field overlooking the valley of the city with the long shadows of the trees all around them. Jim was embarrassed and laughed. That's a shock, all right, he said soberly. What can you do? Oh, I suppose I'll go back to Ronan's till it's over, she replied lightly. I suppose he'll have to, Jim said broodingly. We couldn't afford to rush into anything now. They said nothing more for a while, and then Fanny got up and brushed herself and they crossed the fence into the lane. I suppose that was why you led me up the garden path like this, she said at last. Oh, be God, Fan, Jim said warmly. I led you up no path. You wanted to get your own back on me for pinching the money, she went on in the same tone of chagrin. We're quits now, if that's any satisfaction to you. I didn't want to get my own back at all, he said indignantly. You had more experience of that than I ever had, Fan. Who told you that, she asked quickly. No one told me, he said gloomily. I knew. Things grew a little clearer in her mind. Never once had it occurred to her that Jim would know that what had sent her flying back to Cork was not the loss of the money, but a silly love affair, begun in a mood of braggadocio and continued till it got on her nerves. Her only satisfaction now was that whatever advantage Jim had taken of it, he had been deeply hurt. 
I had, she said bitterly, but never with a cowardly scut that threw it in my face after. Then she went off, half walking, half running down the lane in the twilight. When her father knew, he covered his face with his hands. If it had been anyone else, he would have gone out and killed him. So he said anyway. But how could he attack a boy who had already been robbed? Moll had no such compunction. She was now engaged to the Draper's Clark, and though he was broad-minded enough as Draper's Clarks go, she didn't want to give him anything to be broad-minded about. She called it Jim's and had it out with his mother, an old trooper, whose only comment was that Fanny should think herself lucky not to have got pneumonia as well. Encourage her son to marry a trollop who had already made away with ninety pounds that should have come to her. Did Maul think she was mad? Jim came in while the argument raged and hung up his hat in embarrassment. You know what I came about, Jim, said Maul. If I don't, I can guess, Jim said with a smile. The girl has no mother, said Maul. If she hasn't, she is a damn good substitute, said Jim. I never said otherwise. You will marry her, won't you, Jim? Maul said. I can't, Maul, he replied, raising his voice. I might be able to afford it in a year or two, but I can't do it now. A year or two will be too late, Jim, cried Maul. A girl in her state can well afford to do without a house, but she can't do without a husband. And start off in a furnished room with a kid, said Jim, scowling. I saw too many do it, Moll, and I'm not going to do it. That's all about it. She said she'd go to London. But how can we afford to send her to London, Jim, Moll said with exasperation. You know how much we have coming in. I'll pay my fair share of that, said Jim. A more fool you are, bawled his mother. A girl like that, that might be anyone's. Now, mother... Jim said, I'm not denying anything about myself and Fan and I'm not trying to shift the blame either. I'm responsible and I'll pay what's fair, but I will not get married. That's all about it. After that, Moll saw Father Murphy and he promised to get Jim's employer to put the screw on. But it turned out that the employer wasn't so sanguine about his ability to do so. Big our father, he said candidly, I wouldn't mind anyone else. Only Jim is the sort of lad, if he got it into his head that he was being threatened, might walk out on me. And I'd be a long time before I got as good a man. I might talk to him in a friendly way. But Father Murphy knew that to talk in a friendly way to a young fellow who wanted a fee for singing at a church concert was only a waste of breath. The next time, Fanny came back from London without any display of finery. The baby was put out to nurse in Rochestown and not referred to again by the family and things went on much as before except that Moll married the draper and Bridget got engaged to the bank clerk. But then a funny thing happened. One autumn evening, Fanny was coming out of a tea shop in Patrick Street when she almost bumped into Jim... It was one of those occasions when anyone is at a disadvantage, when it depends on the weather or the state of your digestion or even, going back farther, what sort of people your parents were, whether or not you salute a person. And the decision of a lifetime has to be taken on the razor's edge without a moment's consideration. Maybe these are the only true decisions. Hello, Jim, she said. Hello, Van drawled Jim, raising his hat. How are you getting on? Oh, all right, said Fanny, with the sinking of the heart she would have felt anyway on realising that the decision had been made for better or worse. Going anywhere in particular? he asked doubtfully. No, she replied uneasily, realising the enormous effort of will it would have needed to restore the situation to what it had been a minute before. Next evening, without telling a soul, she met him at the cross and they went out walking again as though nothing had happened. It was several days before it became known and this time there was nobody who was not scandalised. The Ryans were the most scandalised of all. It was all very well for Moll, who had her draper's clerk where he couldn't escape her, but Bridget's bank clerk was still a bit of a toss-up 
and everyone knew the unmannerly way the banks had of going into their officials' private business. Fellow that let you down like that, said Bridget in disgust. You should be ashamed of yourself. Well, said Fanny on the verge of tears, I suppose I let him down too. And damn well he made you pay for it, snapped Bridget. I'm only doing it for little Michael's sake, said Fanny, trying to find some reason for conduct that even she realised was unreasonable. Yes, said Bridget, to make sure he's not an only child. I'm not such a fool, said Fanny. I hope not, said Bridget. Even that much the family didn't dare to hope. Her father refused to speak to her. He was disappointed in her, but he was far more disappointed in Jim, a boy who had once shown signs of character. Up to this, he had believed that it was only daughters who could make one's peace of mind so precarious. But now he began to think that a son might be as bad. When Bridget married, it made things harder for Fanny. It's a lonesome feeling for a girl when the last of her sisters has gone off and their prams have begun to come back. In one way only, it made things easier. Gradually, it began to dawn on old Ryan that this was a very suitable arrangement, a daughter to keep house for him in his old age, who, unlike Moll, could never take a high moral line with him. What would not do at all for a young fellow might do very well for himself, It might be God's holy will to reward him in this way for the trials of the past. Then one evening, while himself and Fanny were having supper, Jim Piper walked in. Ryan looked up and turned his head away. Even Fanny was embarrassed. It wasn't at all like Jim. Won't you sit down, she said. Begar, I don't mind, replied Jim. Good evening, Mr Ryan, he added ceremoniously, but Ryan ignored him. I don't know what the hell is coming over Irish hospitality, said Jim good-naturedly. You say good evening to a man and he won't say good evening back to you. They'll sit there drinking tea with the pot on the hob and not even ask have you a mouth on you. Fanny suddenly realised what was wrong. Jim was drunk as a lord. She'd never seen him like that before. Will you have a cup? Laughing in spite of herself. I had to ask for it, said Jim. The old man drew a deep breath through his nose and then got up and went upstairs, banging the bedroom door behind him. No doubt he was resisting the temptation to kill Jim with his own hands. Jim laughed. Apparently he wasn't aware of the danger he was in. Tell that man come back, he said. I want to invite him to my wedding. When would you say we ought to get married, Fan? I don't know, said Fanny, humouring him. When do you think yourself? I don't give a damn, said Jim, rising. I banked the last of 200 quid today. You can go down to Rochestown tomorrow and bring up little Mike. I can't say fairer. Fanny stood looking at him for a few moments, unable to tell whether it was earnestness or drink. And then she suddenly gave a low moan and ran up the stairs, sobbing. Jim looked after her and collapsed back into his chair and covered his face with his hands. Her father stamped heavily down the stairs and stood at the foot like the hero of a melodrama. What ails her? He snapped. Jim looked up. The same thing that ails me, he said glumly. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. You can start in the house whenever you like. The money is there now. Ryan digested this for several minutes before the beauty of it began to dawn on him. He nodded several times. Then he winked. I think we'd be justified in celebrating the happy event, he said archly. Fanny! He called up the stairs. There was no reply. Fanny! He said, peremptorily. We let her alone, he whispered after a moment's pause. I suppose it came as a bit of a shock. You ruffian, he added with another wink at Jim. If I'd have done it 30 years ago, I'd have been master in my own house.